Okay, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for coming down on your holiday fall semester break. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Matthew Walter. Um, the reason why I have to double check the name is I emailed the wrong person um, about the schedule and stuff, so my friend was wondering why I was emailing all this stuff. Um, but uh, it's, it's pretty great that he's here. Uh, I've known him by reputation uh, through some of his work, so I want to learn about it firsthand. It's related to contextual aware uh, robotics. And, you know, just by way of pedigree, uh, as you can see on the screen, he works at the to Toyota Technical Institute in Chicago, which seems like a, a pretty good place. Uh, one of our very own, Avin Bloom, he's there now. Um, and in terms of where he grew up, he got his PhD. Uh, actually, it's pretty cool. He got his PhD from MIT and Woods Hole at the same time. And John Leonard was the uh, MIT advisor uh, at CSAIL. Uh, of course, he left all that slam stuff or generalized it to this contact aware stuff that he's going to be talking about today. So without further ado, I give you uh, Matthew Walter. Thanks, Howie. And wh what's the policy with masks? For s oh, oh, I um, so, should so I keep it on? I'll, I'll tell you, my policy, my policy is you can take it off as long as everyone here is comfortable with that. <laughs> <laughs> Any objections? I'm happy to keep it on. Okay. Yeah. 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 I won't. I won't move closer. It might be easier to talk. Yeah. So thanks. Thanks, Howie, for the introduction. I'm very happy to be back and just happy to be traveling now that hopefully COVID is going away. Um, so I'm yeah, again Matt Walter, and so I'll tell you a little bit about TTI. How many people here have heard of TTI or are familiar with TTI? Okay. So not many. Okay. So uh, I'll give you a brief introduction. So TTI Chicago Toyota Technological Institute Chicago. So that's why we say TTIC. It's a little easier to parse. It's a, it's a strange entity, so it's a philanthropically endowed uh, graduate level CS institute. We're sort of like a computer science department that grants PhDs and masters, primarily PhDs, and only PhDs in a university in one. Uh, founded from an endowment from the Toyota Motor Corporation through TTI, hence our name. We have nothing to do with Toyota. We don't get discounts on Toyota cars or anything of the sort, unfortunately. Uh, we have 11, 11 tenure track faculty, faculty like everywhere else, and then we have 10 right now, and it, it fluctuates, but 10 research faculty. So these are hard money positions. They're paid from the endowment. Um, three years, competitive salary, research budget to do whatever you want. No teaching obligations at all. And with, even, with, even within computer science, we're very focused. So that's machine learning theory and what we call applications of machine learning. So that's computer vision, that's speech, NLP, computational biology, and robotics, as well as CS theory. Uh, we're small, 42 PhD students. We advise about 10 or so U Chicago students, so we have a close affiliation with U Chicago. We are the TTI in Kitty. I'm sure many people are familiar with the Kitty data set, so we are the TTI. And this is where we're located, just under there um, in Chicago. So just shameless plug number one. We're hiring, you know, like, you know m many universities are hiring, uh, both for tenure track as well as research track faculty positions. So again, research assistant faculty, it's a great position. Three years, nice salary, no teaching obligations. Tenure track, it's a very light teaching load, so one quarter, so 10 weeks a year teaching, but you're paid for nine months. Um, a great pedigree of students, or sorry, faculty that have gone through, so over 65 RAP faculty, and many with CMU affiliations. So Avram, as, as Howie mentioned, is currently at, he's our chief academic officer, basically essentially a department head. Um, Kevin Gimple got his PhD in LTI, and then was an RAP, and a, uh, is now a tenure track. And then several current CMU faculty spent some time at TTIC. So if you're looking, you know, please keep us in mind. That's the link. Okay, so I run the Robot Intelligence Through Perception Lab. I'm going to talk about a fairly small subset of the work that we do in my lab. So this is a current set of students. Actually, Tree there works on neural memory architectures, just graduated. Um, so we do work on you know, perception-enabled robotics, um, so stuff on self-supervised 3D vision. Uh, we do joint work on design and control of robots, work on transfer learning in the case of robots faced with, you say, RL tasks in the presence of distractors, so trying to generalize to beyond the domain in which they're trained. I have some students that are more interested in theoretical aspects of RL, so uh, that's Kazaya uh, uh, and, and Falcon here. Um, but I'm going to talk about the work that we do focused on language. And so what I'm interested in, I'm sure many of you here, is getting robots away from this regime of being used solely as automated agents working in highly controlled um, environments. We're doing the same thing over and over and over again. And clearly there's use cases for that now. But I want to get robots out of these domains. And we have, so we've had a lot of success over the last several decades based on what we've done dealing with our ability to mitigate uncertainty. 
So, and so we see a lot of domains where you're getting robots to do things that are, you know, the classic dangerous or difficult part in unstructured environments. So this is old by many standards, but this is the work that we did in, for the DARPA Urban Challenge on our Frankenstein of a vehicle in late two, uh, 2008. Um, some work that I did um, a while back on 3D reconstruction of the Titanic, so underwater vehicle stuff, which I've gotten back to in some respects, not the Titanic, but underwater domains that maybe I'll talk about if I have time. But these highly unstructured environments, but we're here robots are operating as our surrogates, you know, doing things where, you know, that we're remotely, maybe remotely controlling them or giving them some high level command, but they're operating in isolation of people. And so what I want to do is I want to bring robots in our unstructured environments where they can work with and alongside people. And there are a number of domains that I have and currently looking at. You know, manufacturing is clearly one. Um, logistics, so this is a, a forklift that we developed. This is a while back again, you know, maybe seven or eight years ago now that could do material handling alongside people um, and operatable by people who are not roboticist. Um, I'm very interested in assistive technologies, so helping people who are, have physical or cognitive impairments maintain their independence. So again, robots working very closely alongside people. But if you look at really where we are today, you see systems that look like this. So on the, on the top is a video from Canova Robotics of this user uh, operating this, I think this is a Jayco arm here. So I don't know if you saw it. He's controlling the arm, it's a joystick, by his foot. And he's doing low level control, I think it's switch mode control of the, of the, of the arm using his foot. Clearly not effective. I mean, again, it allows him to do something that he could not do on his own, which is great. But still, there's so much more that we, we'd like to be able to do. On the bottom is a, a video from a replay, a, a rendering from the DARPA Robotics Challenge. This is MIT's team. And so they had three people interpreting video and, and, and LiDAR point clouds streaming back from the robots, issuing, again, there was, still, there was some autonomy, but foot locate, placement location. So still very highly involved. And, you know, these are people with PhDs in robotics in the bottom case who are, who are controlling it. So not, you know, not your grandmother. So what we need is more effective ways of commanding and controlling robots. And I argue that one way of doing that that's quote unquote natural is to use free form language. Really where you can talk to the robot as if it was a person. And so that's how I think of this work is, you know, how, I want someone to be able to talk to the robot as if there was a person driving the forklift or a person pushing someone in the wheelchair or a person controlling the arm so that someone who's not a roboticist can interact with these systems. Um, and there's been a lot of work in natural language understanding for robotics, dating back to the seminal work by, by Winograd in the early 70s, a lot of work that's been done here in the Robotics Institute and, 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 and at LTI. Much of the earlier work in this area, again, late early 2000s, was very much formal logic based, where you have a set of hand-coded rules that are mapping a, a fixed grammar to a set of rules that some controller on the robot could interpret. Um, with you know, the growth in statistical methods, there's been more work in statistical symbol grounding, where you're learning in some sense, or you are learning, to map language to some formal specification of the task. And so this is some of the work, in, you know, some of the work that you'll see that Tom Howard I know talked about last week falls in the, in the, in the latter camp, and work that we still use today. Um, so this is just a factor graph for you might for a pallet ta uh, a forklift task, so, but a probabilistic model that is learned from language. Okay, so this is typically how modern day symbol grounding methods formulate this problem is as one of probabilistic inference. So you have some distribution P that you're trying to maximize. By searching, but you're given, I should say, you're given a command, a sequence of words, and you know, pick up the palette on the left, et cetera. And you're trying to infer the set of uh, the, the reference for this command. So the set of objects that the person is referring to, set of locations, spatial relations, the actions in the robot's repertoire. And this is drawn from some symbolic set. Um, and typically you do this by assuming access to a world model. So you know the environment. You know the set of objects that are available. You know the set of behaviors that the robot can perform. And your goal is to, given that, infer which ones maximize this likelihood. So, and we've done some work on this. So let's say you have a wheelchair that's navigating a hospital or an office-like environment. You want to be able to ground, and sorry, this is, might be difficult for, to parse, but you want to be able to, uh, you know, robots want to be able to ground words to locations in this map. And so what we've done historically, you know, as Howie mentioned, I used to do SLAM, you know, back in you know, olden days. And so typically what you do is you run an off-the-shelf SLAM algorithm, like an ISAM, like Michael Kess's ISAM algorithm. It gives you a nice metric map. And you go through by hand and label these locations. So I would label, I'd la label the um, elevator lobby, the office, et cetera. Um, that's a pain. 
And again, you need a roboticist to do that. And so we did some work where what we would do is instead do what you would do to, with another person. You give them a tour. And this is, you know, this is older work. This is RSS 2013, 2014. But Sachi here gives a tour to the wheelchair. It follows him and he describes things. And so that's easy to do. He can say, I don't know what, the, this is, the gym was to my left. That's fairly easy to understand. But the cool thing about language is that it has essentially an unlimited field of view. So I can describe things that the human or the robot cannot currently see at the moment. And I can use it to convey semantic, metric, and topologic information. There's a fair bit of ambiguity, but I can convey information in a pretty succinct, efficient manner. And so we would do that. We would use language as part of this narrated tour to learn these maps. And that's why in, the, in this slide you see these pie charts. And this is, you know, the person said something, but in, in natural language, describing where the elevator was, and the robot's able to infer these semantic distributions. And again, all probabilistic because, you know, language is uncertain. Yeah? So the words that you see there, I have trouble seeing um, with my mask and my glasses. It's my first time with this. Yeah. Um, so, but um, are those words, are they from a known library of words? So, so when the person walks in and there's an elevator, at least they can access as an elevator, or is it completely... No, so the robot has seen the word, the model has seen the word ele elevator before, yeah. Yep, yep. So we've trained on a model, we trained on a model that has this, in it. sorry, there's a training set that has elevator in it. It doesn't have to have that exact phrase, but it has elevator and we're able to exploit the compositionality of language to sort of leverage this training data. But it's seen it. There's been some work in doing this with audit, completely audio domain words as well, but I, I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, so anyway, so that's what we do. So what, but what happens if the world model is not known? You know, you stick a robot in an environment it's never been into. The person may have been there and you give it a command. Right now, the, so you don't have that S in the world model anymore. What are you grounding to? And that's what I'm going to focus on today. And so that's the problem. Again, we're going to formulate it probabilistically. I apologize for the change in notation. But now what we're getting is input now, or sorry, the output is going to be the robot's trajectory or some sequence of actions. You know, pick your favorite. The input is language. So superscript T denotes the history of language that the robot has received up to this point in time. We have the various sensor streams on the robot, so LIDAR, camera streams coming in, and then, of course, odometry. And we want to formulate language understanding as an inference problem like this. But we, don't, we no longer have the set of symbols to which the language is should be grounded. Okay. So what we do is we introduce the semantic map, and I'll describe what that is in a bit, as a latent random variable. So if we knew the semantic map, we know how to do that that operation on the left. That's what I was describing before. There are a lot of known methods to do that. But we don't know it. Um, all we have is language and the sensor data. So we formulate this as a problem of inferring a model of the world and then using that inferred model of the world, which is in this case is a distribution, to do language grounding, the language understanding. And we also introduce this additional behavior, which is sort of related to how you might want to explore to understand a command if you don't have a map or you have a distribution over maps. Um, but you know, I'll go through this in more detail. So we formulate this as three basic uh, phases. So one is of map learning, where we want to take the language that we've received up to this, per, this point and the various sensor observations on the robot. And there should be an odometry there. It just didn't fit in the slide. Um, use that to build a, a model of the world or a hypothesis of what the world looks like, so metric and topologic. Then we use that distribution to figure out how the robot should behave. So planning under, formulating is a planning under uncertainty problem uh, over the space of abstract behaviors. And then a low level policy learning that figures out. Now that I have a sense of what the world looks like, albeit in, term, in form of a distribution and the set of behaviors, what's the best action I should take to, bet, to, most, to satisfy the command or most likely satisfy the command? And so this is challenging for a number of reasons, is that your language is very different from other sensing modalities that we're typically used to using, so vision and LIDAR, uh, which is good and bad, right? We want to exploit, like we've been doing in robotics for a while, exploit the heterogene heterogeneity of these sensors. They're complementary, so take advantage of that. But that can be tricky. Um, the policy itself doesn't have a map. It has to reason over a distribution over maps. Um, and so in the space of be observations is, is, is large. So I'll just step through how we actually formulate this inference problem. So one thing we exploit is that, again, so the command is, you know, it's a command to go somewhere in the environment. And what we, what we exploit is the fact that as part of this command, the, the command itself provides some information about the environment. So I might say, go down the hallway to the kitchen on the right. So what I'm doing as part of that is I'm telling the robot that this environment has at least one hallway. And down one of those hallways, there is a kitchen on the right. I'm not telling it how far it is on the right, but 
and which or which hallway it is, but one of those has a hallway on the right. And so what we do is we infer these set of symbols, which are the existence of these regions in the environment. Like I said, we don't know where they are, but we do know that there is a kitchen, there's a hallway, and that they exhibit this down from relation. And um, we do that via, and I believe Tom talked about a variation of this, this model, so I won't go into too much detail. But we have this grounding model called hierarchical distributed correspondence graphs. If you've seen Tom's talk, they're all variations of you know, different acronym, acronyms involving, HDC, uh, d involving DCG. Uh, but it has some grounding space, which again is the set of objects, regions, spatial relations. And we infer, again, some model. And the way that we formulate this, and again, I'll go through it very quickly, is we have as input, the observation is the language, the space of possible symbols. And I, I think it's probably maybe, maybe easier, though maybe not looking at this, is looking at the graphical model. But what we have is, so, in the, uh, so this, the structure of this graphical model follows from the parse of language. So we get the hierarchical structure from language. And so um, what we have is it should be shaded random variables or the observed random variables. And for, what we want to figure out is what, does, what symbol does hallway, is hallway associated with? And so when the symbol phi is true for a particular symbol, that means hallway is associated with that grounding. So we search over the space of these binary corresponding correspondence variables that maximizes this likelihood. So again, long story short, we use this to figure out which set of what we call annotations is the user conveying implicitly or explicitly in this task, in this, sorry, in this command. That in this case, you know, this trivial example, that there exists a symbol that corresponds to hallway, another one that corresponds to a kitchen, and there this down relation between the two. So, and again, we have some things to try to simplify this ugly inference problem so we think we can do this more efficiently, and that's the hierarchical distributed correspondence graph. And this is all available on GitHub, and uh, there's a, a paper from you know, a, while, a while back now that goes through this. But that's not the point. Uh, but again, you get, at the end, some symbolic observation of the world um, that we can then incorporate. Okay, so we use that, and now what we're going to do is we're going to learn a model of the environment. And we're going to represent our environment as what we call this semantic graph. So we have a graph very much like a pose graph, if you're familiar with pose graph formulations of, of SLAM. So we take our environment, and we're going to break, you know, we have a bunch of poses. These are the nodes. Each one of these nodes has some uh, metric embedding, so a pose, if you will. So that's X here, and then we have a set of labels. That could be like the semantic attributes associated with objects, or regions, slash locations in the environment. And that's how we represent th this environment here. And then a set of edges that are spatial relationships. Again, this really is very much like a pose graph, but with the addition of having semantic information as well. And so we want to maintain this distribution over the topology, the vertex poses, and the semantic labels based upon language, odometry, and the other sensing modalities. You can imagine when I, language is pretty good at conveying some uh, topologic information and some spatial information. So if I say there's a, kitchen, there's a kitchen down the hallway, that tells me that somewhere in this map there should be at least one node that corresponds to the hallway, another one kitchen, and I have some information about their spatial relationship. So it's like a spring in, in this pose graph system that we're able to exploit from language. Of course, there could be many and will be many hallways, and there could be many, many kitchens, uh, but we know that there is at least one. And so, again, this ugly model, we factorize, again, no approximation. Here on the right, we have this graphical model, and, sorry, this, sorry this, the graph itself, rather, and we represent, so this is the distribution over possible topologies. And so we represent this graph using a sample-based representation, so particle filter. And so we have a set of samples that associated with each, each sample is hypothesizing the topology of the world. And we exploit the fact that, well, you know, we, we, we're not worried about the combinatorial complexity here because most, you know, most environments we're operating, you know, they're man-made environments, they're inherent, you know, there are walls that limit spatial connectivity. So I don't have to consider the space of all possible topologies. It's probably that most topologies have very low likelihood and there's a small set that have high likelihood. So I just want to capture those with the set of particles. So we have this particle-based representation. And then one thing we do with this, and this actually dates back to some of my, long, from long ago, my, my thesis work, is that we represent this using a, model this distribution using a Gaussian. 
And as many of you may know, that you can formulate a Gaussian in many different, in a couple different, well, two common ways. The most common is with a mean and covariance, mean vector, covari and, uh, mean vector and a covariance matrix. You can also do it in what's called the information form. So an information vector and an information matrix. That's the inverse of the covariance matrix. And the information vector matrix, and this is again something that ISAM exploits, has a very nice form that, and you can relate this to the, we have a Markov random field, but again, I won't go, Gaussian Markov random field, I won't go into details. But basically what we have is we have our, our toy pose graph over here. Each one of these is a location, so it has an XYZ pose or XY theta pose. That corresponds to a, an element in our random matrix. You look at the information matrix, anywhere you have an edge, you have a non-zero entry in your information matrix. Where if there's not an edge, there's a zero entry in your matrix. And this topology, for most man-made environments, is fairly sparse. Most nodes are not connected to, you know, most nodes are, have, are only connected to a few other nodes. So the matrix is sparse. And so by modeling this in the information form, you can exploit this sparsity to do inference in, in, in linear time, linear in the, in the number of nodes or depending on the sparsity, perhaps constant time with appropriate approximations. So anyway, so my, my you know, thesis from a long time ago was looking at that. So it's nice to actually to get back to that in some sense. And so that allows us to do inference in a tractable manner for fairly large graphs. And then the last part is this Dirichlet distribution that we use to model the semantics. Okay. And so we update this using, so we have this hybrid of this, um, just real quick. We have this hybrid of this sample-based representation and this parametric representation. So one way of doing this uh, is using what's called a rao blackwellized particle filter. Essentially all that means is taking a particle filter and coupling that with an analytic component. So if you're familiar with FastSlam, came out of you know, CMU, you know, early 2000s or so, that was using a, a rao blackwellized particle filter. Okay. And so that's what we're using here to update this distribution. And so what we do is the person gives a command and they make follow that with, with they may, that may be followed with additional commands. We take that in, that's again the, the lambda t that was there, and then we, up, we hypothesize a map based upon language. That's going to be fairly uncertain because of, you know, I didn't tell you where the hallway was, how far down the hallway it was, et cetera. So the robot hypothesizes a bunch of maps, and that's what we're showing here. So this chartreuse color denotes the lab. We have these orange that are denoting possible locations of a hallway. There are edges, I'm not visualizing them, that capture this down from relation. These are the labs. And as the robot navigates and observes, observes things, um, you know, observes something that in the laser scan is similar with a hallway, sees a microwave or refrigerator, starts updating this distribution as it navigates. It still maintains a hypothesis. If you, if you notice here, there's an additional hallway here. So it has a hypothesis that that's the hallway that the user was referring to. And off the map here, there's, a, there's another kitchen there. So it's capturing the fact that it could be one of those two hallways. Oh, and again, really that we're using more particles, so there are other hallways elsewhere that the, you know, the areas that the robot hasn't seen that may have a hallway. Right? And it's updating this as it navigates here, and then ends up going, in this case, to the kitchen and finding it. Okay, so that's how we, in a, in a, in a nutshell, and you know, the papers provide far more detail, but how we maintain this model of the environment by exploiting information that's available in the instruction. Um, and coupling that with different sensing modalities. And so now we have, and I, I skipped the behavior inference part, but now we have this distribution over worlds, and we want to, again, in the end, our goal is to execute some trajectory that's consistent with these instructions. And so now we formulate this as a, you know, a planning under uncertainty problem, because we don't, our map is not deterministic. We have a distribution over worlds, and we want to plan in that distribution. So again, we formulate this as a planning under uncertainty problem, Sequ in particular sequ sequential decision making under uncertainty. So we look for as a policy that takes as input the robot's current pose, or really in practice is an estimate of the robot's pose, and the distribution over the world, that P of S, that's conditioned on all the observations that we've gathered, and outputs the next action. It's so, you know, the next location to go to or stop. And we want to find, again, this is, you know, fairly you know, old school in many respects. We, for, we formulate this as this cost minimization problem, and we're going to learn the cost, or learn the parameters of the cost. So you know, a la inverse optimal control or inverse reinforcement learning, learning from demonstration, et cetera. So we formulate this cost function as a set of, in this case, this was um, a set of primitives, a set of features that capture things like path geometry, landmark geometry, relationships between the two, et cetera. But again, these are over distributions, not over deterministic worlds. So we look for some embedding. In this case, we, look, we use an RKHS 
embedding, uh, basically taking the first k moments of the distribution, and that's our feature space to represent our cost function over distributions. Okay, and those are our features. Again, just the expectation using the first k moments. Again, I don't remember in practice how many first four moments maybe we use. Um, yeah, again, so we, ex we express our cost as some weighted combination, linear combination of these features here. Again, fairly, you know, again, this is you know, old school in many respects. And then we have this multi-class hinge loss where we have a set of demonstrations. So we actually have people navigate environments they've never been in following instructions and we record their behavior and we assume that they are optimal or near optimal and we learn the weights we learn the weights that result in the same behavior that they executed, right? A fairly standard way to do inverse optimal control or inverse RL. And we use that to learn the weights of this cost function. Okay. And so this is, our, again, our complete loss with some regularization penalty. There are some issues now as we execute this. We might find ourselves in states that we did not see during training. So again, the, a domain shift. And so what we do is we use a method called, many of you may be familiar with, called DAGGER, data set aggregation whereby we collect data, we train a policy, execute the policy, if we find something that's different than what we saw in the demonstration, we ask a person, what would you have done in this situation? And they provide additional supervision to refine the policy. Um, okay. So we've evaluated this with a, a number of robots. So this was work that was done out of the RCTA, which with a lot of colleagues at, at CMU. So we did this on a couple Husky, these ground robots here. Uh, we have another one I'll show later with an arm. And we did this with our voice commandable, commandable wheelchair. And we look at different variants. So there's the gold standard. We have, a full we have full knowledge of the environment. Let's try to just ground the command and execute it. Another one where we don't have a map, we'll just do our best. Try to understand the command in the context of what we do know and hope that we basically essentially stumble upon the goal effectively. Or the last is our method, where we're using language as this additional sensing modality to learn information about the world. Um, Okay, and we, so we do this in, in simulation, and so we compare against the two. So what we're, we're showing here for the three different methods is the distance traveled by the robot till it got to the destination. And of course, the ideal case is we know the map. So we ground it, and the robot goes directly there. So, you know, that was the distance traveled. If we don't know the map, but we exploit language, you know, not surprisingly, it does, the distance traveled is longer. You know, it ends up maybe going down the wrong hallway first, and then does not see the kitchen, so the likelihood of that hypothesis goes down, that particle goes down, and then the others go up, and then it changes its, it, it changes its, uh, its policy changes, or the action changes, rather. And so it takes a little bit longer. If you're just essentially randomly stum stumbling around, it's about twice as long, the distance traveled. And then we did this with, with, with robots in real environments. We found, again, this is not statistically significant, basically the distance traveled was comparable to what was traveled with a known map and about half of what's traveled when you don't exploit language as a sensing modality. You just hope that you stumble on it. And this is another visualization of that. So this is with the Husky robot with the manipulator. So in this case, the command is to retrieve the ball from the box. And so this is 22 seconds in. So originally, the robot doesn't know anything. Hypothesizes different locations for boxes. Some of them have balls. And what I'm visualizing here might be difficult to see, but in red, are, you know, again, these are just a few of the particles, but different hypothesized locations for a box. Thanks. Different hypothesized locations for boxes that contains balls, and the one in green is the one the policy has chosen. You know, in this case, probably because it's the closest. Um, and it gets there, it sees that it's a box. So now it actually sees that it's a box. It's going to look inside, so it has a camera on the end effector. It's going to peek down, look. It's going to find that there's a cracker box in there, you know, Cheez-Its or something like that, and they're not a ball. So it updates its distribution, and then what it's going to do, it's going to pick a different destination in the back. And, and as it's going, it's seeing other things that's driving around, so chair, suitcase, uh, et cetera, et cetera, monitor, what have you. Um, finds the ball, and then comes back and retrieves it. Um, and so we've done a bunch of these settings in various environments and different types of manipulation tasks where it doesn't know anything about the environment starting out. It has to exploit language to hypothesize the world and then update this distribution as it navigates. Okay, thanks. And so that's one line of this idea of using language as a, as a sensing modality. Um, and so another, again, so my goal is getting robots to work in man-made environments, environments built by and for people. And many of these settings, like our homes, for example, contain articulated objects. 
So objects with constrained degrees of freedom. So again, remember that video from before of the user using the JCO to open up a refrigerator. Typically what we would do with the robot is we'd hard code a model or a policy for that refrigerator to get the robot to manipulate it, ma manipulate that. But then it probably would not transfer to, to other objects. And so again, this is another motivational video of people using, using JCO arms to manipulate things. Again, this is arguing, uh, well, the push button is a different type of kinematic constraint. But these objects that have con constrained degrees of freedom that right now people are really teleoperating robots to, to interact with. And so we want to be able to you know, make it as easy as possible to learn how to work with these objects. And so again, I'll just, what we do is very similar to this idea of giving a tour of an environment. We, give, we, we call it you know, a, a guided tour of manipulation. Really, it is essentially a, a form of learning from demonstration. So I have, I'm in the environment. The robot watches me interact with the environment. Doesn't know anything about the environment a priori. But as things evolve, has some self-supervised objective that allows it to learn models of how the oper environment behaves. And I couple this with narration. So it's, a co couple, it's combining video, so image sequences, in this case RGBD sequences, and then a narration of what I'm doing and how the object works. And so I want to exploit this complementary nature of the two. Um, and again, we're doing this in, a, I should say, really semi-structured environments um, with free-form language, um, no supervision. Uh, it doesn't know anything about the objects a priori. So this is you know, opening a refrigerator. It doesn't know where the refrigerator is in the environment. So we're not using an, an, an object classifier. Uh, it just sees this collection of pixels. It doesn't know how many parts are on the object. Uh, it doesn't know anything about me or my hand or anything like that. It just sees these, the, the, the images evolving as I open the door. And so what we want to do is we want to take this demonstration, visual and, and, and lingual and narrated demonstration, and learn some, some low dimensional embedding of the object's model, some kinematic model of this object from these observations. So that the robot can then use that model to interact with the object. Okay, we do this for a bunch of different objects here. Um, yep, yep, yep. New, again, the idea is in the, when the robot comes back to this environment, or ideally a different environment, it's able to see these objects. And, okay, I, have a, I know how that thing works. This was a hypothesize how it would go about interacting with that object. And these models are all probabilistic, so you can imagine they would, you know, as the robot interacts with them, it can refine this model online, you know, c continuously learning from experience. Um, so it's learning this motion manifold. Okay, so again, why is this, well, what makes this challenging? Scene clutter, I don't know anything about the objects. I don't know how many parts there are. I don't know how they're connected. I don't know where they are versus background or versus the human. Again, really to the robot, it's just a collection of point, uh, RGBD points in an image or in a sequence. There are occlusions, et cetera. Um, so again, there's been a lot of work. Again, this is old work by, by today's standards. So Dove Katz did a lot of the seminal work in this. And there's been more recent work with neural methods trying to do this, typically assuming one degree of freedom. And with su often, in some of the approaches, at least, uh, George Conodaris has done some. I believe his is where they have supervision, uh, or maybe it's Scott's. Anyway, where they have supervision, so they know during training what the model is. We want to do this in a completely self-supervised manner. And so this is an example of what this might look like. You know, person opens a drawer. We have April tags that's purely for ground truth, or we actually don't let the method use them. So if you see April tags, they're just there to, as a baseline to see how well things are working. And we learn some model, so you can see it to the left. There's this graph again that we have, and I'll go into a little bit more detail. And how am I for time? Is there a? It's usually we end around 4:30. Okay. But some people push it all the way to five. No, I won't do that for your sake. Um, no, it's all good. Um, um, we're, we're, we're always curious who wins the job. Who the the, the, the go, to go the longest? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tom Howard ends around 4:30. Really? I'm surprised. Last time I saw him give a talk, it was. Uh, longer than that. Um, okay, so, so yes, yeah, so the goal, so that's the graph that we want to learn. So we're, you know, I'll, I'll go through the details of how we do this. Um, but learning how many parts there are, how they're connected. So that's this kinematic model. So you know, just real quickly. So what we have for the model, and I'll go through the graph is. So for each, we have the, for each part, there's a node in the graph, and there's an edge between parts if there's some kinematic relationship between the two. So in this case, zero is the background. It doesn't really know the frame of the cabinet versus the wall. That's just stuff that doesn't move. And it knows that that's connected with drawer number one. So what is that? The middle drawer. And that's a prismatic motion. So we're learning the semantics of that edge. So whether it's rotational, ri prismatic, or rigid. And then the parameters of that. So what's the axis about which it translates? And how far does it translate? And what's its current position? So what's the displacement? 
Um, and so that's a graph that you might imagine, imagine learning from these. Okay, and so this is again, this. And we, we have, we, again, nominally we, we can consider all possible graphs. You know, most articulated objects don't have too many parts. So you could, it's actually tractable to, to actually model all possible, all possible graphs. And so that's the way we formulate this, is figuring out what's the topology, what's the graph structure that's most consistent with the data, and then, in that, in that case, is how many parts are there and how are they connected, and what are the semantics. And then once I have that, what's the model, the lower level model that best captures that? So what's the axis of rotation or translation, et cetera? And again, we model this as an inference problem. So again, we have as input our data, so that is, image sequences and free form language. Again, we assume it's grammatically correct, but otherwise just, you know, and, and we, words that we've seen during training. But, um, and then the goal is to infer this distribution over the graph, which again is the configuration, the topology, also with semantics. So edge being prismatic, rigid, or, or, trans, or, or rotational, and then theta here is the parameters of that model. And so that's the way we do. Here's again an ugly architecture formulation of this. Is it worth going through? Um, yeah, let me just go through this and I'll skim through the rest because I don't know how much, how much people are interested in the, de in, the, in the details. But again, so we have, we'll start up in the upper left hand corner. If you can see, it might be a little hard. So we have this sequence of frames, that's F1 through FT. And then for each frame, we extract a set of trajectories. And we're using low level, you know, traditional image features here. I don't know if this was faster for using SIFT but not learned features. Um, and we're tracking them over, over the object as they move. And then what we want to do is we want to segment things that are moving from things that are not moving. And so that might pick up the human versus the drawers that are moving. And then we do some clustering. So we do, uh, I think we, uh, some form of spectral clustering to associate, basically what that allows us to do is group trajectories that correspond to the same part on the object. So that tells us essentially how many different parts are in there and which features correspond to which part. And then we, form, and then we have their trajectory over time. We view that as a, as a, not a big, but as a slam problem. And then we estimate the pose of each one of these parts based upon that entire sequence. So there's a pose graph and we're using ISAM on, under this to, for this to do inference. And then we use that to fit the best model. So that's like the topology, how many parts there are, which part is connected to which, and then what are the semantics of that part, prismatic, rigid, or translational. And then what we do is we take language and we parse it and we have a DCG or HDC or some variant of these conditional random field symbol grounding models where we want to infer a set of symbols and we fuse that with, with the topology that we get from vision to infer the, the, the actual model itself, something that captures the metric properties of this, this kinematic graph. Okay, again, yeah, so. Um, so again, this is just step giving some examples, uh, good features to track, that's what we're using here. Um, with dense optical flow, some filtering, and we have some forward, backward for consistency, but we get these trajectories, and again, as I said here, we have the April tags, we don't, we mask them out so they can't cue off of them, we can't get features off of them, it's just for ground truth. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll go through, um, skip through this for the sake of time. But again, this is forward, backward consistency. Um, then we, we cluster these to get features that move in a consistent manner. Um, in this case, they rotate. And again, I'll just go through this for the sake of time here. Um, and then with the, again, we have our clustering now. So this is showing an adjacency matrix showing how we cluster these based upon ones that move in a consistent manner to identify that they actually correspond to the, to the same part. And that gives us the nodes, and then now we need to figure out the, how, what, what are the edges in the graph? You know, what's connected to what, and, and how are they connected uh, semantically? And so that's, we, we use the poses that we estimate from this. Again, it's an ISAM optimization. Um, yeah, so I'll just go through this for the sake of, skip through this for the sake of time. Um, so, oh, let's just see. Again, we're using a variant of, D, this is actually DCG, so not HDCG, but again, a, a symbol grounding model. Again, I've already given the plug. All of the, the code is available on GitHub, and I think there is a new version coming out, or actually may have come out this past week, uh, or a couple weeks ago, maybe. Um, but again, for us, again, we have some space of symbols that we're grounding to. In this case, it's the parts, the drawer or the door, or the door handle, et cetera. Space of spatial relationships, or this kinematic relationships, so fairly small symbol grounding set prismatic, rotational, rigid, 
um, some notion of, of affordances. And so this is we get, you know, a man o opens and closes the cabinet doors. This is the factor graph that we get out of it that's based on the structure of language. Again, as before, we have our binary correspondence variables that are true if this phrase or word corresponds to that particular symbol, like door versus prismatic versus rigid. And then we take the one that maximizes this likelihood. And that gives us the graph, and then we estimate the parameters of the graph. Okay. So we evaluate, we collected about, I think it's like maybe 50 demonstrations of common household objects, laptops, microwaves, doors, drawers, refrigerators, et cetera. Um, and we provide these demonstrations with, with narration. And then we get this, what we call this learn motion manifold. It's basically the kinematic model on how the robot or the agent would hypothesize the object moving in the scene if they were to exercise its, its, its affordances. And then later on, we encounter that object. And we're able to, again, hallucinate how it works. So this is the predicted motion manifold. So having seen it from a different viewpoint, different location, how would this object move, or how would I as, an, as, a, as a robot, interact with it. Okay. And so we compared this with, again, the, with the, the, the state of the art at the time. This is like what, 2017, I think we published this, was one of, one of Dove Katz's his methods, um, which I think assumed known knowledge of the parts. Uh, most of the work at the time assumed they knew how many parts and or had fiducials on the parts. So they would actually use, say, the April tags as, as, as knowledge of the parts pose. And so we evaluate in terms of just what's our accuracy of the model and what's the accuracy of the pose that we're estimating, so lower is better. And that we, fo we found that ours performs um, significantly better in many cases than these, these other methods that are exploiting prior knowledge of the objects. Um, and OK, so I think it's just the last part. And so that's just good. another example. And we have, we have, there's other work in my lab using language as a, as a sensing modality, incorporating it with other sensors that, as roboticists, we're more used to using, like LiDAR, camera, maybe back in the day, sonar or underwater sonar. Um, but exploiting language as a complementary sensor. But you know, if robots are to be working safely and effectively with humans, I think it's important not only be, that we be able to command them using natural language or convey information to them using natural language, but also to, for the robots to be able to use language to convey information to their human partners. And this could be things like some collaborative tasks that they're performing. The ro robot tells the human what to do next based upon their model of what, you know, the, what, the, what the human is currently doing. Or you can imagine, say, a, a firefighting or a, a military application, and this is motivated by, or driven by the RCTA, using this to establish shared situational t awareness to the user. So using language to convey information to the, to the user that's relevant for their task. Right? And so we looked at a surrogate version of this, which is navigation again but providing directions to a human to get them to navigate some environment. Um, so if you've used, I guess, Apple Maps or Google Maps recently, again, I don't know how recently, maybe in the past year, they actually reference landmarks. I don't, they did not used to do that. It was, you know, go, you know, go a kilometer down the road and take a right or take a right on Vassar or, you know, State Street. Now they'll actually say, Apple Maps will say, take, the second, take a right at the second light. I think Google might actually reference buildings, et cetera. Um, and so that's, the, that's a similar idea here, is we want to provide directions that allow a human to navigate an environment they've never been in. And, you know, and the, so the question is, how do I formulate this task? And so there's a couple things. We refer, the, we refer, we refer to this as, you know, the first one is content selection. So there are a lot of different things I can talk about. I can use metric, I can say go forward, you know, a kilometer, or I can say take a left at the Starbucks. Maybe a kilometer is better because there are a bunch of Starbucks that, that's perceptually aliased, or people prefer landmarks versus locations. There are a bunch of different ways that I can convey this task to a human. If you imagine the, the other domain where it's the, the robot describing the location of, let's say, three people that need to be rescued, there's a bunch of things that could be conveyed, but only a small set of that is actually relevant for the task. And so that's the content selection. How do I take all these things I could talk about and distill it down to a small, succinct set. So that's content selection. And then the second part is surface realization. So that's now that I've figured out what to talk about, how do I actually convey it to a user, a person, in a way they can understand? So how do I convey it through natural language? And so this is this collective problem sometimes referred to as uh, selective generation. So selecting what to talk about and then how to talk about it. Um, and so there's some work that we've done that I'm not talking about here, but in more NLP domains where we're doing this, taking a database and converting it to a succinct set of, uh, of succinct description. Okay, so the way that we model this is 
content selection is, is a Markov decision process. This, so we have a policy that figures out, given all the things I know about the world, what is a small set of things that I should talk about? And so again, this is a toy example, of course, but if we have a map that looks like this, H is hat, E is easel, L is lamp, C is chair or something, and that's the path. Again, this is a toy example, but figures out, you know, for that path, what's, what should I talk about? And so maybe in this case, it makes sense just to say walk forward once, but then I might say face the easel. Again, this is a, a toy version of this. And then I might say move to the lamp. And so that's handling all this, figuring out what to talk about and then how to, to realize this. And the way that we formulate the content selection is, a, is a, as I said, is an MDP. And we want to learn humans' preferences. So we collect a bunch of demonstrations of how people would convey instructions to someone else. And we use inverse reinforcement learning to learn a reward that captures the, the, the value of certain types of information over others. And then we use that to train our content selection policy. So that says, given this, all these things I can talk about, here's what you should talk about at this point in time. Then the agent acts, and then you say, here's the next thing to talk about. And then for the surface realization, it's a fairly like standard now sequence to sequence architecture. It's, uh, there's some subtle differences, but formulates as a sequence to sequence learning problem. So the input is a sequence of things to talk about, and the output is natural language. And we can, we can, tr we, we can train that end to end. And I'm just skipping over a lot of the details, but we evaluate on this in what is arguably an NLP circle. It's a small data set. So SAIL was collected by Matt McMahon. He was a student of, of Ray Mooney's and Ben Kuyper's at UT Austin. Roughly 3,000 demonstrations, so freeform instructions paired with paths, collected by six people giving instructions to uh, uh, people having them navigate unknown environments. Um, again, you know, one thing we can do to evaluate this, like with, with many generation methods, you try to use an automatic method. So there's something known as blue, so higher is better. You want to be close to 100%. It's not the, none of these automatic objectives for language are very well suited. So I'll talk about some other means of doing the evaluation. And one thing you can do that's you know, maybe arguably interesting is you can look at, sort of look inside to see what the network is learning. And again, if you've looked at aligners, this is pretty, uh, aligners or attention architectures, this is you know, very simple now. Um, it's just this toy scenario, but it's learning to associate words like um, bench on your right with these abstract symbols in this database. It doesn't know that that's a sofa, it's you know, object number five, but it learns that you know, that should be associated with bench in this case. Okay, so to get a better sense of how well this works, we went on Amazon Mechanical Turk and asked 42 people to interact with a, with, with a system. So we stuck them in this virtual environment, um, and had them na and we gave them instru an instruction and them had them had them navigate, and we flipped a coin and a, you know coin came up came up heads. We gave them a human generated instruction from the data set from held out part of the data set. If it was uh, uh, it came up tails, we gave them you know they interacted with our system, um, and we looked at things like how how accurately did they act did they reach the destination. And they found that they were actually more successful, slightly but 4% more successful following our method than following the human instructions. People mixed up their left and their right. Um, we, we asked them you know, things just to rank on a Likert score. How informative were the instructions? How easy was it to follow? How confident were they in their destination? And in all cases, they rated ours as better, some by as much as 20% over the human instructions. Um, when we asked them, was this generated by a human or a robot? they were able to tell them apart, which was very confusing for us. Um, and there were some like subtle grammatical errors, like you know, they used, instead of um, you know, an easel, they would say a easel or an car, these subtle things that we think people were queuing off of that allowed them to tell the, the difference between the two, um, so they could tell. But um, so, okay, so that's that. So shameless plug um, number two. So I don't know how many people have heard of Ducky Town. So it was a class that started in 2016 at MIT, and then we taught it in 2017 together. And Ducky Town has evolved to many different things, but there's a lot of excitement in the, in the machine learning and computer vision communities about embodied vision, or you know, learning for embodied agents, robots, for example. And really, there's not a good way, at least to, in my belief, there's not a good way of benchmarking progress in this domain. Um, and so a lot of the work that people do in the learning and vision communities is working with either data sets or simulated environments. And so one thing we've been doing with IDO for the past several years is using it as a platform for benchmarking progress in self-driving and in related technology. So how well could a, a completely end-to-end -end RL 
agent do to navigate an arguably simple environment. But you know, if you can't do this, it's certainly not going to be able to do real driving. And there are whole other facets to Ducky Town. There's a lot of outreach activities. Um, it might be obvious why. Um, and so we have IDO coming up, IDO 6 at NURPS, unfortunately virtual. Uh, NURPS is going to be virtual. But I think it's, it's worth, I, I think worth checking out. We have a, a, a reasonable simulator. We have a great simulator coming up to speed. We have these things that we call uh, um, auto labs. So these remote labs, we have one at TTIC and there's another one at, at ETH, where it's a ducky town with infrastructure to do localization. And you can de train, develop, and test your model on a remote ducky town that might be thousands of kilometers away. Upload your code with Docker, it gets deployed in a robot, and it drives through a series of tests, uh, training or a series of experiments. And you get all the data back and you know, ground truth trajectory, et cetera. And that's what we'll be using for evaluation because it's not in person. Um, so that's the shameless plug number two. Um, so yeah, one thing I wanted to show, but I didn't, you know, I, I didn't give time to edit to the slide, but some of this work, again, it's not only for robots working with humans. So just two weeks ago, we came back from a, a research cruise off of, off of LA where we have this underwater manipulator called Nui, near it under the ice, designed to go 6,000 meters down. We were about 1,000 meters down. And what they're interested in doing is using it for remote science with the ultimate goal of using this to explore the moons of, of Jupiter. And so what we had is we have this vehicle 1,000 kilometers down and we had scientists on shore in Woods Hole, so the, opposite, the other coast of the US, talking to this robot, so using speech to command it, to do things like take samples. So we have what's called an XRF, so X-ray fluorometer. We could get, we can identify elemental composition of items in the scene. And then another scientist using language and a virtual reality interface to control this arm over you know, thousands and thousands of kilometers and in some cases over an optical modem to the, to the vehicle. So really cool, but again, I didn't have time actually to put the, we're still working on putting the video together. But okay, so it's not all for robots working directly with alongside people, but we've also used these methods in, you know, in these, in these uh, um, surrogate-like settings. Um, so this has worked with a lot of people, many people who are or have been at, at, at CMU, several people at, at TTIC who are currently there or were there, so Mohith who is working on the language understanding. Um, all the papers are avail available on uh, our lab's website at the, at the bottom. If you have any questions, feel free to email me or better yet, you know, ask me now. So that's it. Thanks. Any dumb questions? So I guess I can ask a question. Um, so, so you covered a whole bunch of topics in, in your talk. Mm -hmm. So I apologize if I'm getting something wrong. But when we were back at the open the drawer, mm -hmm. and you, fig, you know, figure out those degrees of freedom, I guess, and figure out the get semantics behind those degrees of freedom was mm -hmm. there. So I was wondering, do people in the design the mechanism and design community you worry about those sorts of things too. Uh, in other words, you know, for reverse engineering maybe. Uh, and the reason why I'm interested is, is we, we do a fair bit of stuff back here. We do a fair bit of work with modular robots. That's, so that's, that's the connection to my interest. To be more specific? So, so I have a mechanism design, mm -hmm. um, you know, that has different parts mm -hmm. and there's parts <coughs> mm -hmm. So I was wondering, is what you're thinking, would that apply to doing reverse engineering? I see. Uh, I see. Yeah, so just observing it mo move and figuring out how the, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, so we, we've been thinking about that, so for, again, for a robot arm, I get actually motivated by um, this, this underwater setting. So one problem we have with this robot that we use, the arm in particular, is that we don't have very good feedback on the joint position. So we have a reasonable model of the kinematics you know, the, the, the distance between the joints and the axis of rotation, but we don't know the joint angles. Did you say so, sink? Huh? Did you say underwater sink? Underwater sink? Underwater snake. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, you, 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 you like, you like, you know, yeah. snake, uh, yeah, no. Um, so it's a, it's, a, it's a robot arm, six degree of freedom robot arm, but it's to be power, as, somewhat as a consequence of being power efficient, you don't have very good feedback on it. And so we've thought about using this for that, but that's a, maybe a, a much easier domain. Uh, but just observing it, you, I mean, you could. It's really what you need to be able to, you, it has to be some from 
class, something you can describe with a graph like this. So it's either rotational, prismatic, or rigid. Though there are abstractions to that. You can do things like local linear embeddings to make it more expressive. Um, Mm -hmm. curious, you know, it's, so it's not a linear, it's, it's not a straightforward linear degree of freedom. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's going to be slight perturbations. Yeah. Uh, I was curious how your framework Yeah, so this, right now we're only dealing with, you know, prismatic and rotational, but there is some work in this area that does, like I said, local linear embeddings to try to get more expressive models. Right, right, that's, 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 yeah, to do something like this, exactly, yeah. that's true. Yeah, I, that would be hard, I mean, I think doing this visually, just because the motion is so subtle. Um, so one thing I didn't talk about with this is that once the robot has this model, it's, again, it's all, it's all probabilistic, so hopefully it knows what it doesn't, well, it probably doesn't know completely what it doesn't know, but there is some uncertainty. And so the robot should be able to go and interact with the environment and refine it. So if you imagine taking this and coupling it, you know, maybe it thinks it's initially prismatic, and it goes to manipulate the drawer, and that doesn't work. But then it's able to refine that model by, you know, maybe it randomly discovers this jiggling action or has force feedback and it's able to discover it. You could refine, refine the model. Yeah. 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 Yeah, this is a little bit off topic, but um, at the beginning of the talk you mentioned uh, dealing with distractors. So I'm just curious about how you're thinking about those. Yeah, so this is very weird. We just submitted something to iClear, so not involving language at all. But the idea is we have some RL agent that we've trained, so it's a you know, hopper walk or something in the OpenAI gym with a nice you know, clean background, say, for example. And all of a sudden, at test time, it's the same agent with the video playing in the background. Or you know, for more robotics-oriented, or the lighting is different than you've seen during training. Um, and so typically, the, you, know, so you have this, auto -distribu this sh distributional shift between training and test. And so the policy typically will, will, will fail catastrophically, even with slight variations. And so the work that we just submitted is trying to learn basically some low dimensional, the way, the way that we do it is we have some, we learn some low dimensional representation of the state that you know, intuitively maybe it captures the pose of the agent. You know, it doesn't explicitly, but that's sort of the, the motivation. And whether you have a video playing in the background or the light is changing, the pose should still be the same, or at least the, the kinematic should be the same. Um, and so the way that we do this is we take our clean environment, we train our policy, and then we collect a bunch of uh, examples under hybrid of the train policy and a random policy, and we collect and the embeddings, so some low dimensional representation of the images, and we collect them in some replay buffer or some buffer. Then when we go to the distracted environment, so the idea is that that's over some distribution. There's no Parker, is there? No. Okay, you can imagine. A curve, oh, here we go. I mean, I, I don't really need to draw too much, but it's, you can imagine that, you know, it looks something like this. And this is our distribution during training. If I take that generator and apply it in the distracted environment, you know, my distribution probably looks something like this. So what I do instead is, so this is, this is Z, whatever my latent embedding is. I collect it in a buffer. And then what I do in the distracted environment is I have my generator G. So this is going to take as input an image. This gives me some embedding Z. And then what I do is I feed this to, uh, so it's like a GAN-like objective. So I have a discriminator here. And that outputs a label. Is Then I also give it as input. So this is Z tilde, let's call it, Z distracted. I grab a sample from my replay buffer. That's Z. And I try to fool the distractor into not being able to tell them apart. Really trying to take this distribution over here and shift them over. And then we have some another thing here that is we have some um, uh, 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 inverse model here that we try. We take two Z's actually. So, so this is Z tilde T and Z tilde T plus 1 into an inverse model. And we try to predict the action um, so that the, this embedding is note. So the distribution is not just the same, but it's more semantically meaningful in terms of the actions. Um, yeah. So would this still work with, like, if you have, I'm thinking, like, grammatically incorrect or error-prone statements, because, like, speech recognition systems, yeah. for example, often make mistakes. Yeah. Would this still work with Yeah, that's a good question. So this model would not. Um, 
One thing that you could do with that that would be interesting is, as part of the speech recognition, if, you, if the language model comes back and says, you know, I, I, didn't, I wasn't able to understand that, you can maybe go back to the recognition and say, well, maybe I should try one of, my, one of the other solution outputs. Um, we have other work that I didn't talk about, which is more really more neural based, really a sequence to sequence model. I mean, I talked about the generation part of it, and that is much more robust to to grammatic. I mean, it doesn't assume anything about the grammar. It doesn't have to be grammatically correct. All it has to do is be consistent with the training, and that, of course, is far, that is far more robust. It also requires more data. More data. Yeah, I like. I mean, I think there, there's certainly clearly room for. Both, and probably probably the best solution is a hybrid. What I what I like about this, for this at least for this line of work that I talked about, is the uncertainties that we get out of it. Um, that you know they're reasonably well calibrated, so they're useful for the, the fusion part of like the route the part of the filter say in that case or estimating the model. Uh, but the probabilistic models that you know sorry the neural models that we have at least that we have, I don't have a good sense of how well they're calibrated. Like how meaningful are they? If they were to give uncertainties. How meaningful are they? I don't know personally. I think that's still, as far as I know, still an open question. Any more questions for this team visitor? All right, let's thank you again. Thank you.